Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about this uh, CPU infrastructure, circle patterns. And then, so this talk, I, I want to do it in a different way. So I want to focus on this potential of policy. And so one reason is because uh, I have several discussions with my with colleagues, and then I, I have the feeling that, so this uh, infinitesimal rigidity of circle packings and circle patterns, uh, so for, for, for those questions, you can you can use this potential Laplacian to deal with things. So I think uh, so I think I should take this chance to advertise. So how this potential Laplacian, and then also how this one is used uh, in the proof. Uh, so in my work, so about this about the con conjecture by Kojima, Mr. Shima, and Tan. And then yeah, I yeah okay. So let's see how how this goes. So I my goal is I really want to talk about how this potential Laplacian is used to study this uh, CP1 structures. So this is, and then, okay. And then more, more than that, it turns out this cotangular Laplacian is not only useful for the torus, and then it can be uh, used in some other cases uh, more than that. So, so okay, let's, so let's, let me say what is uh, this uh, circle pattern. So for me, a circle pattern is a realization of a planar graph uh, on the Riemann sphere, such that the vertices of each face lie on a circle. And then more than that, also require that the neighboring circles will intersect with the prescribed intersection angle. So let's say theta between uh, zero to two pi. And then, so one thing I want to say is, so this circle packing is a special case of circle pattern. So the way how I do this is the following. So if I have a circle packing like this, so what I'm do, going to do is I, I, I okay, I, I, I put the vertices for all the tangency points and then and then I can connect these neighboring vertices and then find an edge. And then, and then now this one give, give me a face. So this will give me one face. And then if I do it for the other circle, so I, I have this face and then here I also have one face and then I also have one face. And then, and then I, I do this the following. So, so here, so here, so automatically for this face, uh, you, have a, you have a circle already. And then for this face, you also have a circle uh, passing, going, going this way. So, okay, so all together, so you will get a, so if you give a circle packing by taking the tangency points, then you get a realization of a plane graph such that the vertices of each face lie on a circle. And then more than that, so if you look at kind of this circle and then, so this extra circle and then the original circle, all these circles will intercept 90 degrees. So this theta, they all take value uh, pi half. So really intercept in a prescribed angle. And then if I do something more than that, so if I, because later on, I prefer the triangulation, I prefer the graph to be a triangulation. So I would just uh, take, I just take the diagonal. So I just put yeah, more edges. And then in this case, so if you measure the intersection angle uh, for this, yeah, okay. So for this circle, you have this circle. And then for, the, for this triangle, you also have this circle. So if you look at the intersection angle of these two circles, this is just exactly equal to, to zero. So, okay, so more or less, so whenever I have this circle packing, and then by looking at this dual circle packing, so these are the dual circle packing, then I will get a circle pattern with the prescribed intersection angle. And then it's always pi half. If I put more diagonals, then I will get uh, this zero. So this thing can go backwards. So if you have this circle pattern in this way, then you can also separate into two parts, this circle packing and also the dual packing. So uh, you don't lose anything. So this uh, circle pattern, that's what I mean. So yeah, it is, it might be different from what you heard of uh, last few days. So yes, uh, yeah, so yeah, okay. It is a little bit different from the talk by Joe, uh, Jay Joe. Okay, so this, so this, this circle pattern for me. And then whenever you have four points uh, uh, in the plane, then you can compute the cross ratios so, so what I want to do uh, in the following is I want to parameterize my circle pattern using cross ratios. So if you give me a planar graph, then I can subdivide it into triangulations. And then now we can assign a cross ratio for every interior edge. So, so if you give me one, uh, one edge and then I have two neighboring triangles, then I have four vertices. And then now I can compute the cross ratio of these four vertices and then assign the compass number to this edge. And then this would define a function, compass value function over edges. And then now you ask, so what kind of fun, uh, equation would this cross ratio satisfy? And then it turns out if you multiply all these cross ratio around one single vertex, then it is equal to one. And then, and then, and then if you take this, uh, this summation, then you will get zero. So what does it mean? So if you, 
uh, yeah, actually, so this equation just tell you that, so the holonomy, the holonomy around each interior vertex is the identity map. So we call that, so if you give me some triangle, and then if you tell me what is the cross ratio of, of this edge, then I, I know how to figure out this triangle. And then if you tell me this, the cross ratio for this edge, I know how to lay out the second one. And then if you keep doing this one, then when you go backward, like when you, when you go once around, the original triangle may differ uh, from the, the last one by a mobile transformation. So this is a matrix in SL. So this is, a, you can regard it as a matrix, SL, uh, SL2C. And then, so the eigenvalue is just lambda, one over lambda. And then now you want to make this identity as an identity. So you want to make this uh, eigenvalue as, as equal to one. So this is, yeah, this one is really means the eigenvalue is equal to one. And then, and then now, yeah, you want to have this uh, off diagonal entry to be zero. So this zero is really this zero. So all together, so this equation just tells you that the holonomy around each vertex is identity. Okay, so that means, yeah, you can just lay out all this circle. And then, okay, so now, so we focus on this cross ratios. So, yeah, okay. And then now I, so I start with a triangulation of a closed surface then a cross ratio system is just a map uh, defined on the address such that uh, these two equations are satisfied. And then now we want to focus on this Delaunay uh, so-called pattern. So I, I say a Delaunay angle structure is an assignment, a theta over address. And then now instead of zero to two pi, so now this angle is go from zero to pi only. And then satisfying, so whenever you look at uh, one vertex, the sum of all this angle around one vertex should be equal to two pi. And then if you take any uh, close loop on the dual graph bounding more than one vertex, then you, you, the summation of this angle should be larger than two pi. And then, yeah, so this equation is mysterious, but I'm pretty sure you have seen it uh, in the last few days. So, okay. And then, so now what, what we are going to do is, so we want to consider the space of all these cross ratios uh, satisfying these two equations. And also the argument of X is equal to theta. And then, yeah, so this argument is equal to, you can also write it as uh, the same thing as the imaginary part of the log of X. Okay, and then it turns out, well, why we consider this, uh, this argument of X is because, so if you look at uh, uh, this edge, so you have two uh, circle, and then you have the cross ratio over this edge. And then if you look at, yeah, this uh, intersection angle, this is theta, so it is exactly given by this uh, the argument of X. So yeah, the, the argument, the cross ratio is very convenient. Okay. Okay. So this P theta is the space of uh, cross ratio X uh, such that the imaginary part of the law of X is equal to theta. And another way to say this is, so these are the space of circle patterns with prescribed angle theta on compact projective surfaces. The reason why you have this CP1 structure is the following because so, so you can imagine, so each, uh, each circle, so actually each disk is your, is your chart. And then if you know what is the cross ratio for this edge, then you know how these two disks are grouped. And then in, in particular, these two disks are grouped by a mobile transformations. So yeah, altogether, so if you know this cross ratios and then it's Delaunay, then you get this, uh, the, the charts and then you give you a CPU structure. So yeah, so this P theta, so you have everything. Okay. 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 Now I just come down to the to the to the main results that I'm going to 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 explain. So okay. So this P theta, PM are uh, denoted as the space of CPU structure, and then TM is the tangential space, and then the theorem A is the following. So if you fix any triangulations and any Delaunay angle structure on the torus then I can tell you that this P theta is a real analytic surface homomorphic to R2. And then this P theta to the space of CP1 structure is an embedding. And then in particular, the holonomy, holonomy map is also an embedding. And then the second, the theorem B is the following. So if you consider this P theta projected to the tangential space, it is a homomorphism. So everything is about, about the torus case. So, so these two th theorem, so they are exactly so they, so they, they prove the conjecture, this Kojima, Mr. Shima Tan conjecture uh, for the Torus case. And then, so I'm, I'm going to explain you uh, uh, the, 
so the proof and especially how this uh, cotangular Pathian is used. And then, so but before that, so I want to mention that. So I, I really like this theorem is because, so this theorem just tells you that this discrete conformal structure can be very different from the classical conformal structure because whenever you pick two points uh, uh, in this space, you have these two circle patterns with the same intersection angle. So usually we will regard them as having the same discrete conformal structure. But now if you look at the underlying uh, classical conformal structure, and then this theorem just tell you that they can be very different. So, so I think this is the very nice thing about, about, about uh, this conjecture. And then for the case genus is larger than one still conjecture. Okay, so this are, uh, yeah. So, so the whole thing, this background has been explained very nicely by Philip Boas on Tuesday. So I'm, I'm going to say much about this. So I'm just go to the proof directly and about this uh, also this cotangular pass here. Okay, so this is its outline. So I'm, yeah, just, just so this outline is more or less uh, the outline uh, given by Kojima, Mr. Shima and Tan. So they, they, they are in their paper when they make the conjecture, they already outline. So what are the steps that you should, you should take? And then, so these are the steps. So I'm going to say this. So I'll show that this P theta is real analytic surface and homeomorphic to L2 and then projection to the tangent is proper map. And then this is local homeomorphism. And then in particular for that part, this cotangent Laplacian is very important. And then I will, I will show you why is this the case. And then in the end, I can, I will tell you that it is indeed a homomorphism. Okay, so, so more or less the plan. Is there any question? Okay, so, so these are the statements. And then I'm going into the proof. So if everything's fine, then I'll just move on. Okay, okay. Okay, so the first thing is, so this P theta is a real analytic surface. So you know, remember, so this P theta is defined by an algebraic system. So, so what we need to do is to study that algebraic system to show that it is a real analytic surface. So now I take a family of cross ratio that satisfy those algebraic equations. And then, if I, and then now I take, uh, take a lot of this cross ratio and I compute this uh, derivative. And then I call it as Q. So in other ways, again, right, it's X dot divided by X. So one thing observe that this Q is real value because uh, as I said, so when I look at this space, so the imaginary part of the log of XT, they always equal to theta. So this always equal to this Elonian angle structure. It is independent of, of T. So when you differentiate this guy, the imaginary part that the, the derivative is zero. So that means only the real part, uh, 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 is a five. So, it's, so that means why this Q is real value. And then if you differentiate those algebraic equation, then you get the following, the summation of this QIJ uh, is equal to zero. And then it's also have uh, this, uh, this summation is equal to zero. So, so what is this Q? So actually, so if you have, yeah, so this P theta is some have, have some algebraic equations equal to zero. And then now this Q is just telling you is telling you that, so this Q is living inside the Jacobian of this algebraic equations. So what we want to do is we want to study the kernel of this Jacobian. And then, and then it turns out, okay, so okay, before that, so this, uh, this Q, uh, we also call it as a discrete quadratic differentials. And then, so if you uh, have heard of my talk at ISM last year, when I talk about a, a topic on this, then I explain, so how this related to the self-stress. In, in fact, this quadratic differential is really the self-stress in the setting of circle patterns. And then, okay, and then that's it, okay. And then now, we, yeah, okay, so what we want to do is we want to study the kernel of this Jacobian. And then it turns out that as uh, we will see, so this Q is related to discrete harmonic function. And then from there, we can use this maximum principle to deduce what is the dimension of this space. And then it turns out the dimension of the kernel of this Jacobian is always equal to two whenever you are, whenever you have this uh, Delaunay circle pattern. And then, and then all together, if you have this constant rank theorem, then you can deduce that this P theta is a real analytic surface. Okay, so, so this, this part is very easy. Just, you just want to need to make sure the dimension is equal to two. So uh, we will see how to do this. Okay, and then now, and then come to the second part. So. If I really know that it is a real analytic surface, so I want to know what is the topology. So it turns out it's a homomorphic to R2. And then there we need to talk about the affine toroid. So, 
Okay, so this complex affine structures on tori. So affine structure uh, is a maximal analysis of chart to see such that the transition functions are affine maps. So these are the affine maps, uh, AC plus B. And then, yeah, so if you have this conformal structure, then the transition function is a conformal map. If you have a CPU structure, then these are the mobile transformations. But okay, now in this case, it's affine structure. So we just consider the transition functions as affine maps. Okay, and then now what we are going to do is we want to parameterize the, uh, the affine structures on, on torus. So how can we do that? So how can we parameterize this affine, tor uh, affine structures on a torus? So okay, first of all, if you want to, if you have, if you want to get a Euclidean torus, so what can you, uh, what can you do? What you can you do is, uh, you just take a quotient, so uh, by a lattice, so generated by one and then by tau, and then tau is a complex number, imagine plus larger than zero. Then if you look at this lattice, then each fundamental domain is a parallelogram, and then if you grew this opposite side of your parallelogram, then you get a torus. So so this tau. So the message is this tau parameterize the conformal structure. So it parameterizes the tachymeter space. So different tau give you different point on the tachymeter space. Okay. And then for the, for the affine torus, so what can we do? So, so we know that, so actually the developing map of all these affine tori can be given by this mapping. So you just take C and then you take, uh, take an exponential map. So you take E to the map to the ZC. And then for some non-zero number, and then if you if you do this, then you map your torus uh, to the something. If you take the exponential map, then you might get something like like this. So this is the origin, and then yeah, this is the origin, and something like this. You just you just yeah, just take the exponential map, then you get something like this. And then and then the message here is so this affine structure on the torus are parameterized exactly by these two number, tau and c. So in the case that C is equal to zero, then it will give you the Euclidean torus. Okay. Okay, so, so a fine structure on the torus are parameterized by these two numbers. Okay, so this is what we are going to look into. And then, so one more thing before moving on is, uh, so we can look at the holonomy of the affine structures. So if I write this gamma one, gamma two, the generators of the fundamental group, then um, yeah, so if you have the developing map, so you have the, the point and then you shift by gamma one. Okay, so this gamma one is this one. This is gamma one and then this is gamma two. So this directions. So if I have a point, I shift by gamma one. So it means I have just C plus one because it's the, on the lattice. And then if I apply the developing map, then I will get this constant, uh, some multiple constant e to the power C. Yeah, so this multiple constant. And then, so this is, uh, and I just write it as row one. So this is the affine holonomy. And then if I move it to gamma two, then I'll just shift by, by tau. And then if you put it in into this formula, then you see that, so this, const, uh, this constant comes up, then this is my, yeah, affine holonomy for, for this gamma two. Okay, so we go, are going to use it. Okay, and then now you might ask, so why we need this, a fine structure. And then the, the thing is for the torus, so we can always reduce CP1 structure to a fine structure, and then it will make uh, everything simpler. So, so the, the reason is very simple. So because you notice that this pi one torus, the, the fundamental group is abelian, uh, gamma one circle gamma two is equal to gamma two circle gamma one. And then if you look at the holonomy of the CP1 structure, this uh, uh, row one tilde and the row two tilde. So these two, you can regard them as, a, as two by two matrices. Uh, yeah, so in particular, they are SL2C. And then, and then they also satisfy this relation. So if you remember in linear algebra, so if you have a two matrices, two matrices, so you have this AB equal to BA, then you can deduce that the eigenvalues are the same. Okay, they have the same, they share the same eigenvalues. So from linear algebra. And then, but then in terms of this mobile transformation, it just tells you that uh, this O1 tutor, O2 tutor, they share either uh, one fixed point or two fixed points. And then if they share one fixed point, then what we can do is we can make this point, we can take mobile transformations and then normalize uh, this developing map such that that fixed point is at infinity. And then in that case, this O1 tutor, O2 tutor will become uh, translations. 
And then if we have two fixed points, then we can make one point at the zero and then the other point at infinity. And then in that case, uh, yeah, we can get this non-Euclidean affine structure. Yeah, so, so this, uh, what you do, and then, and then it turns out, so this is, uh, yeah, uh, theorem by Gunning. So every CP1 structure on the torus can be reduced to an affine structure. So, so one thing you should be careful is that, so whenever you have this CP1 structure, you will give you some affine structures. So, so if you have one CP1 structure, then you give you tau C or tau minus C. The reason is because of the following. So here, if you have this uh, non-Euclidean affine structure, you have two fixed points. There's a choice. So you can make this point at zero and at this point at infinity or the other way. So you can make this point at zero and then this point as infinity. And then if you do this two different choices, it will give you two different affine structures. And then because yeah, the correspondent is exactly, you just interchange zero to infinity. So it's really just a mapping from C to one over Z. So you, you will just make this, yeah, this affine parameter from plus C to minus C. So, but then, okay, but, but originally they represent the same CP1 structure. So, so that is the statement. So whenever you have one CP1 structures, you can get two different affine structures. So this is tau plus C or tau minus C. Yeah, but then the underlying CP1 structures are the same. Okay, so now, so if you remember uh, our theorem saying that, the theorem B is saying that, so the, the space of circle patterns on CP1 structure is, is homomorphic to the tangential space. So now instead, if you say, uh, instead of uh, complex structure, you consider a fine structure, then you can also make a similar statement. So the statement will become the following. So if you look at the space of circle patterns on a fine tori, then the projection to the tangential space is two to one mapping. The reason why you get this two to one mapping is because this CV1 structures can give you two different affine structures. And then, yeah, okay. So, so here's a, one remark. So if you just stick to the affine structure, then the projection to the tangential space will become a two to one mapping. Okay, but then if I want to make my life simpler, then I'll just stick to this CP1 structure, then, this, then it will be a homomorphism. Okay. Okay, so this is one thing. So we can reduce CP1 structures to a fine structure. Okay, and then now here's a result by, by within. So within, result will tell us the following. So this circle patterns on a fine tori, in fact, they are parametrized by the scaling part of the holonomy. So here's the precise statement. So here you have this theta, any Delaunay angle structure, and then A1, A2, they are just some real number. Then there will exist a unique affine structure with holonomy in this form, such that the scaling part of the holonomy, which is a given, this is the, okay. So usually the, the scaling part is the, the magnitude of, uh, of alpha, but then if you take uh, the log of alpha, uh, that is just the real part. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, okay. So if you yeah, look at the real part of the log of alpha, so this is scaling part, and then which is really, yeah, kind of the, yeah, how, yeah, how your circle from one fundamental domain get scaled to another circle. Okay, and then, yeah, scaling part uh, is this one, and then there will also exist a circle pattern, and the cross ratios will satisfy this. Uh, yeah, the argument is given by this theta, and then it turns out, yeah, and the more of uh, if a one, a two, they are both zero, then then so this is. This, these are all equal to one. So these are all equal to one. And then, so you could just get translation. Then in that case, you get the Euclidean torus. Okay. So this is the uh, result by reading. The way how he, he, he did is by looking at this uh, revisional argument. So revisional method uh, to do this. And then, okay. And then now, so we can say a lot from this theorem, in fact. So, okay, so, okay. For, so for the non-Euclidean torus, so we, we just assume this beta equal to zero. And then, yeah, and then the theorem by within actually it proves the rest of theorem A actually. So first thing is P theta is homomorphic to L two. The reason is because, yeah, if you have look at this uh, circle patterns on affine tori, so these are parameterized by these two real number. So this is L two. And then if you look at this circle patterns on affine tori, and then you map it to uh, 
circle patterns on on complex projective surface, it is a two to one mapping. So if your upper one is homeomorphic to L2, then you know that the lower one is also homeomorphic to L2. So, so you know that this P theta is homeomorphic to L2. And then and then now because so this uh yeah, this affine, yeah, so the affine toroid that you get are parametrized uniquely by, by this the scaling part of the holonomy. So, so what you, you can deduce the following. So the holonomy mapping of this P theta is an embedding. It is because, yeah, so whenever if you have this two, if you have two guys, the scaling part are the same, then they must be the same circle pattern, the same affine structure. So, so you have, yeah, so you, you really have this, this embedding. And then if you have, you know, this holonomy map is an embedding, then you know that if you have this circle patterns, you forget the circle pattern, you look at the CP1 structure, then this mapping is also an embedding. And then so altogether, you get the theorem A, so very easily coming from this uh, result by within. So the, the main difficulty is how to prove that the projection to the Tachimura space is the homeomorphism. Okay, so for the moment, is, is everything good? Okay. Sounds what, okay. which paper of ribbon is that? Uh, it is in N of math. So he considered uh, 1994. There's a paper uh, in N of math, and then and then he considered this uh, the volume of ideal hyperbolic polyhedron, and then and then yeah, if you have this critical point, then you give you this circle pattern. Yeah, that one. And then is is this uh Delaunay angle the same angle system that you set up? Yes, I'm yes, yes. Sure. Yeah. Yes, yes. So there's an yeah. under there's an underlying um combinatorial pattern here in Riven's result. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this this theta is really the theta satisfied though uh yeah. Yeah, so this equation and also this one. And one one more quick question. Um I should have asked this earlier, but but when you have the circle pattern that, and, and you describe the charts, the Mer yeah. uh, CP1 charts. Yes. How do you get the charts for the centers of the circles? Uh, the center, of, you mean this, this one? And when, how do you get the chart for Z, uh, a chart around but, ZI? So you, oh, vertices, yeah. So the, the thing is because I know the holonomy around each vertex is identity. Ah. So that's the point. So oh, if you so just a point and you okay, yeah. So if it's not identity, then you don't get choice. right. Right. Yeah. The, the, the point is identity. <clears throat> okay, and then so. Well, actually, you still you still do get charts. It's just uh, like a cone point, though. Yeah, yeah, cone point. Not 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 a structure on a closed surface. Yeah. So I, yeah, I want to stick to closed surfaces. Okay, and then uh, this affine structure, affine structure. Then now I want to tell you this proper map. The proper map is, is very easy, it's just one slide. So, so previously we look at the scaling part. Now we can look at the rotation part of the holonomy. The rotation part is the imaginary part of the log of alpha i. So what, what is the geometric meaning for this guy? So if you look at this affine, affine torus, so let's say this is the origin, then you have this uh, affine, uh, affine, the fundament, a fundamental domain of your affine torus, then you can measure what is this angle. More or less, you can measure what is this angle. This angle, it turns out, yeah, if this is, if this is, uh, if this is gamma, gamma one, then this angle is exactly the imaginary part of the log of uh, alpha, alpha one. So, so this, this, yeah, this number, so tells you how, how one side is rotated to the other side. So this uh, is given by this angle. And then, so generally, so if you want to tell this, this guy, so this, if you take the log and the imaginary part, it is uh, determined up to a multiple of two pi. However, in our case, so we can, we can just follow this, uh, this, uh, this gamma one to see uh, really what is that multiple. So we can really determine uh, this number precisely. So for example, if I if gamma one is like this, so then I know that 
this number is smaller than two pi. If I know that gamma one, the image of, of gamma one is like this one, then I know that it is more than two pi. So by following this gamma one, then you really can tell what is the imaginary part of the log of our of our eye. There's no there's no yeah, ambiguity about this two pi stuff. No, no. Okay. And then the second thing is so this number is very nice. So it is bounded by a constant depending on your triangulation only. So the reason is very simple. So you, you imagine uh, if you have a uh, torus and then it only consists of three triangles, just something like something like this, and then only three triangles. And then now can can you can you have this fundamental domain? This fundamental domain can this fundamental domain wrap around the origin, let's say ten times. So if you think about this, it is impossible because so we want to have this circle pattern is Delaunay. This circle the triangles are non-degenerate, and then and then if you have just three yeah just three triangles, how can you wrap around the origin? Yeah, ten times so impossible. So in fact, so this is bounded by a constant. So so if you take consider this guy. And then you take a path, this gamma i, this is, so this is your, your, your gamma. And then, so, and then, yeah, so this number is, uh, yeah, is bounded by the kind of the modulus of ga gamma i times pi. And then this gamma i is the number of uh, triangles, number of faces uh, that you cross. So here, so yeah, because, because whenever you have this gamma i, you go from one phase to the other phase, this angle is at most pi. So if you have just, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, uh, n edges, then this angle cannot be larger than n times pi. Yes, which. So, so you're allowing an affine torus that, that could wind many, many times around the origin. Yeah, generally, I, I, allow, I, I allow it. But then if, you fix my if I fix my triangulation, it can't be too many times. But, but it could be more than one if it was a complicated. Yeah, more than one, if you have many triangles. If yeah. you have, yeah, it could be. But then the, the, the thing is, so it so this is the image part is bounded by by the by, by the triangulations. And then okay, so now I, the claim is so we can prove using this result, we can prove the properness. So it's very easy. So you remember, so if you take a log of this alpha one, you will get the affine parameter C. And then if you take the log of alpha two, then you get a tau times C. So 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 we see this here. So so this. Is uh, too too much. So we talk about this affine structure. Okay, so here, so this is my alpha one. So if I take the log, I would I will get the C, I will get C. And then for this, uh, this is alpha two. If I take the log, I will get C tau. Okay, so this is what I need. Okay, so law of alpha one C, law of alpha two tau C, and then you substitute this guy. Uh, into C, then you get uh, these relations. So now what we are going to do is we take the imaginary part of these equations. So if I take the imaginary part of this guy, I will get this one. And then if I take the imaginary part of this guy, I will get the imaginary part of this times the real part of this, and then plus the real part of this times the imaginary part of this. And then now this equation is very useful because of the following. So I know that this guy is bounded. I know that this guy is also bounded. And then if I know, uh, my conformal structure in the tachymeric space stay in a compact set, tau is bounded in a compact set. And then I know that this is bounded and then this is bounded. And then yeah, this guy is bounded away from zero. So altogether, I will know that this guy is also in the compact set. Okay. And then similarly, if I do this real part, then I can also deduce uh, this guy is also in compact set. And then, so now it's very nice. So if I have a converging, sub converging sequence, uh, on the tachymeric space, and then, and then, yeah. So here are the circle patterns, yeah. And then, and then, if I look at the underlying conformal structure, and then if they have a converging sequence, then I can deduce that when you look at the holonomy, this holonomy also have a converging subsequence, and then, and then the limiting value, then by result you get some two different number, and then by result by reason you know that for the corresponding limiting value you will have a circle pattern. And then, and then, and then, and then your claim is, yeah, okay. So anyway, so you just say, yeah, so this mapping is a proper map just coming from this observations. So, 
yeah, you can't wrap it too many times. So it's properness. Okay, now it comes to the homeomorphism. If everything is fine, is it okay? Okay, okay, homeomorphism. Okay, uh, so yeah, I what I need is the cotangent Laplacian. So just because so if I have a realization of a triangle mesh in the complex plane, then a function you define at the vertices is harmonic. If for every vertex i, you have this uh, cij times uj minus ui is equal to zero. So, so what is the summation? So you have, again, you have this one vertex i, and then you look at the neighboring, yeah, you look at the neighboring vertices. So you just take this cij times uj minus ui over all these edges. And then, and then this cij is called cotangent rate. So what are this? So if you look at uh, a, uh, an edge ij, then you have two neighboring triangle, k and then l, and then, now I want to compute the, the, the weights for this edge is the cotangent of this angle, this angle plus the cotangent of this angle. Okay, but anyway, so the cotangent, what I mean by cotangent is just one over tangent. So in case, yeah, this of confusion. So, okay, the cotangent rate of this, for Cij on this edge is the cotangent of this angle plus the cotangent of this angle. And then, so this is a cotangent rate. And then, and then if uh, this just some simple observation is so if your uh, this m is simply connected, then a function u is a harmonic if and only if there exists a conjugate harmonic function defined on phases such that for every edge so you have uh, this relation. So this is like uh, the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So this is the real part of your holomorphic function. This is the imaginary part of your holomorphic function. And then these two parts are related by some equation, the cauchy riemann equations. And then this is the cauchy riemann equations. Okay, so i, j, k, so the function you kind of, you can imagine, so it stay on the, live on the centers. And then, so this one live on the center. And then u, j, u, i, they live on the, on the vertices. And then this u star is called the conjugate harmonic function. And then you need up to an additive constant. Whenever you know u, then it is determined up to a constant. Okay. Okay, so this cotangent Laplacian. And then, okay, now comes to the funny thing. So how this harmonic function related to the circle, pack, circle packing? Okay, so, so the claim is, so whenever you have this, this one-to-one -one correspondence between this harmonic function and this uh, infinitesimal deformation of circle patterns. So if you have this circle packing or circle patterns, you can parameterize it in many different ways. So one thing you can do is you just, you just prescribe the, the radii. And then if you know the radii, if the radii, radius are very, are very nice, then you can lay out your circles. And then, okay, so now if you deform my, my circle packing or circle patterns a little bit, then you have the change of radius. And then you have this L dot, and then you consider this L dot divided by L, and then it turns out it will be a, a, the conjugate harmonic functions. So, you know, so we call that, so for me, I have, so this, uh, these are my vertices, and so, this radius function, they live on, on the faces. And then this U star also live on the faces, so they are compatible. So and then it turns out, yeah, if you have this deformation of your circle pattern, then you have this change of radius and then divided by the, the original radius, then it will be the conjugate harmonic function. Yes, some question. Which, yeah, but which, what's, the, what's the original function? What's the U? Uh, no, U is, no, no. So this R is your original circle pattern. Right. but. But I mean, u star is the con. You mean there is there is some u, so this is the u star. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Actually, so whenever you have u, then you get this u star, and then actually you can go backward. So whenever you have this u star, you can also so, get u. So the deformation defines u star for you, and then you define u by the formula. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So this is like you have, you have one harmonic function, then you can always get the other one. Yeah. Yeah. You also you also also by this formula. Okay. So this is, uh, yeah, it's kind of the harmonic function on the dual graph. Yeah, just harmonic function on the dual graph. And then you can also say, okay, instead of looking at the radius, so we can also look at how the vertices are deformed. So it's like uh, this uh, Z dot, CI dot. And then if you look at this uh, ZI dot and then, and then divided by CJ minus CI, then, then this, yeah, this determined by this formula. And then if you remember, if you're familiar with the, with the this vertex scaling by Fang law, then 
then you may be, it might not be so, so surprising that you can see this term. So when you look at this uh, rotation, it is given by the average of this U. And then actually it's like for this circle pattern, actually you have this vertex rotation. Instead of vertex scaling, you have this vertex rotation. Okay, so this something is, yeah, yeah, okay. And then you can also promotionize this one by the change of the cross ratio. So you have this uh, x dot divided by x. So as I said, you can this this q, and then yeah, q, and then yeah, the the, the cross ratio of x you have this uh, multiple of c j minus c i and then blah blah blah, and then if you take the log and then you take the derivative, then you will just get this expression. And then now if you substitute this formula into this one, then you can express this q i j just in, in terms of this uh, U star and then U. And then, so this is how, how they're related. So if you are interested, then you can just work out the formula, but we are not going to use it. Okay, so this, uh, these are the relations. So this harmonic function, and then this deformation of circle patterns. Okay, and then, then now what we are going to do is, so if you give me the, a developing map of an affine torus, so we want to consider the cotangent Laplacian. So, okay, see developing map of affine torus, then, then this cotangent Laplacian has the following nice properties. The first thing is the cotangent rates are invariant under deck transformations. So if this, uh, you have you have one edge here in one fundamental domain, and then if you consider this edge in another fundamental domain, consider the, the edge ray, they are just the same thing. So the reason is when you do this uh, transformation, you just get an affine map, but then this, uh, Cij are defined in terms of the angle. So the angles are not changed. So that means this Cij will not change at all. So this, so this, yeah. So this really the Cij really live on the torus, but not just the universal cover, really on the torus. Okay, and then, anyway. And then this Cij is also non-negative. This come from the Delaunay condition. So because we assume our circle pattern is Delaunay, so actually it will force this Cij they're all non-negative. And then if you have this kind of graph Laplacian, and then the edge rays, they are all non-negative, then you have, will have the maximum principle. So, so that means, so if you have a discrete harmonic function, you achieving some local minimum, the maximum as some interior vertex, then it must be constant. Okay, so this uh, maximum principle, not so surprising. Okay. So it, is it okay? Yeah, that, that, that is quite a lot of materials in the talk. So I, so yeah, just feel free to interrupt. Okay. Yeah, because I just skipped through all the background because I, yeah, because yeah, so probably you have heard it on Tuesday already. Okay. And then, okay, now, so here we can, so if you have this deformation of circle patterns, then we can, we can consider what is the change in holonomy. And then, okay, so what is the change in holonomy? So we call that, so this is my, the holonomy representation of, of gamma one, gamma two. So if you have, go from uh, a point and then apply this deck transformation, gamma one, then you will just scale by EC. And then for gamma two, you get scaled by EC to the, e to the power C tau. And then now if you have this first order deformations, then this C and then tau would also change. You get a C dot and then tau dot. And then if you differentiate, then you will get, yeah, you get the C dot times yeah, C dot here. And then for this guy, you'll get this C dot tau and then plus C tau dot. And then, and then if you consider this uh, row one dot divided by row one, then, and then that one, it turns out it, it is C dot independent of, of C. And then if row two dot divided by row two, then you get this uh, C dot tau plus C tau dot. And then, okay, now we have this change in holonomy. And then now you ask how this one is related to my harmonic functions. Okay, and then it turns out, if you have this deformation of circle patterns, and then you give me the change of holonomy in this way, then the corresponding harmonic function will satisfy the following. So if you, okay, so originally you have a harmonic function u, and then because I know that this, this cotangent rays, they're invariant under that transformation. So if I look at this guy, it is again a harmonic function because the cotangent rays are invariant under that transformation. So if I take a function, a harmonic function u, and then I decompose with a that transformation, it is again a harmonic function. And then now you ask how this guy is related to the, to the original one. 
And then it turns out they will differ by a constant. And then this constant is the imaginary part of C dot. So this guy. And then if you look at, if you go to gamma two, then the, yeah, the difference would be uh, the imaginary part of this guy. Okay. And then now you ask, so only imaginary part appears and then where are the real part? And then it turns out the real part appears in the conjugate harmonic functions. So if you consider the conjugate harmonic function, again, so if you compare these two guys, they will differ by the real part of C dot, and then these two guys will differ by the real part of, of this guy. So, so the way how you imagine, how, think, how you think about this harmonic function is, so these are the integral of a harmonic one form on the torus. So yeah, you have a harmonic one form, and then when you integrate, then always differ by a constant. So this really actually this uh yeah like harmonic one form. Okay, so now yeah if everything is fine, then we now we consider the Dirichlet energy. So okay, just recall. So our goal is to prove the local homeomorphism, and then what we are going to do is we need to consider the Dirichlet energy. So the, here is the game. So, okay, the first observation is, so if you have this, uh, the harmonic function u, and then if you consider the difference of u, actually, this is well-defined on torus. It is because uh, if I, I know that if I shift by gamma, then I will differ by constant. And then if I have two adjacent vertices, and I have this uj and then ui, and then if I compute the difference, and then this constant will be gone. So, so that means this, num this, this value over edges, is well defined on the torus. Okay, keep this in mind. Okay, so now we do the following game. So, okay, if I have, yes, any question? Okay. Okay, okay. So, so now we have these harmonic functions. And then what we say is it is related to the deformation of circle pattern. And then now, and then, and then just now we relate this circle, that we relate this harmonic function to the change of holonomy. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, that this part is very useful because if I want to know whether my conformal structure change a lot, I really need to look at this tau dot. So if, if the conformal structure is unchanged, then this tau dot is equal to zero. So, so this really how this harmonic function capture the change in the conformal structure, really, really coming from this imaginary part, uh, the, the period. Okay. Okay, now, so let's consider the Dirichlet energy. So if you have this, this so if I have this kind of uh, harmonic function, uh, this kind of functions, and then, so this, uh, it lives on the universal kappa, and then now it's, uh, yeah, it's defined at the vertices only, but then now I can do this piecewise linear extension. So for each triangle, I know the value of u at the three vertices. And then now I can extend it piecewise linearly. I can extend it linearly over the phase and then all together I'll get, get piecewise linear functions. So I get this function u and then now I can compute the gradient of this u. And that's, it turns out this guy is a piecewise constant function. So it's constant over each phase, but then there's a jump. So if you have one phase, go to another phase, you get a jump. But anyway, we can still compute, we can still define What's the, what is the Dirichlet energy for this function? And then, and then, yeah, and then, okay. And then, okay, so, so if you, if everything, if this, if this thing is well defined on the torus, then we can define this energy. And then, and then in fact, so, okay. Um, yeah, and then by a formula by Pinkow and Putty Hay, if you start with a function defined at the vertices, and then do, you do this piecewise linear extension, and then you do this gradient, and then you compute this energy, then you can express uh, this energy in this form. So you have this one half times the cotangent rates times the square, uh, this uj minus ui. Okay, and then just observe. So this thing, uh, this term, the cotangent ray is well-defined on the torus, and then this term is well-defined on the torus. Actually, this whole energy is well defined on the torus. It is independent of your fundamental domain. Okay. So, okay. So, actually, I can really do this. I can do this integration over a fundamental domain. And then I get something independent uh, of, which, of, of which fundamental domain that I pick. Yeah. Okay. So, this is important. And then, and then now, so if I know that this function u 
is harmonic with conjugate harmonic function u star, then this term can be expressed in this form. Yeah, because if you remember, so this, so yeah. Yeah, so how this u, so this, what is the conjugate harmonic function? This, this guy is by definition, the one half of this cotangent and then times the difference of u. So, so you can just write, yeah. So this, this term is just one half of this guy times this guy. And then, okay, now what, what, so this is funny. So what is it? So this is a closed one form. And then this is a closed dual one form. And then now you have a one form and then times the dual one form and then you integrate and then over a fundamental domain. So now what can you do? You can apply Stokes theorem. You can apply Stokes theorem. So instead of integrate, integrating over a fundamental domain, you can just integrate along the boundary. So you have some boundary integral. So if you rearrange, so, okay, you have this fundamental do domain is a, to is, a, is a parallelogram. And then you have two op opposite side and then two opposite side. And then if you arrange these two opposite sides together, these two opposite sides together, then, then you can express. So this, uh, this, this guy in terms of the, the periods of your harmonic functions. So as I said, uh, so if you shift your harmonic function from one, from one vertex to the other vertex, then you get shift by constant. And then also get shift by constant, constant, get shift by constant. And then as I, what I want to say is, if you have this integration over a fundamental domain, and then now you rearrange your boundary integral, and then now you can express everything in terms of the periods of your harmonic functions. And then it turns out it is given by this formula. So, so this formula is not so surprising because in the smooth theory, you have this Riemann by linear identity. So if you have two uh, holomorphic one form, and then you just take the kind of uh, the product and then you do integration, then this, this product can be expressed by the previous of your holomorphic one form. So this is a Riemann by linear identity. And then in the discrete case, it also holds. Okay, so this, okay, this is the game. So this is the, uh, yeah, so this is the energy. So if you have, if you have this uh, harmonic function, if you are, okay, circle patterns, you have this change in holonomy, then you can get this kind of harmonic functions. Then when you compute the division energy, you have a very nice expressions. Uh, wait, I have a question. Yes. I mean, is, is this sort of like the Ve peterson metric on a, you know, like if you take a Riemann surface and you do a little deformation, it's like you have a quadratic differential and then and then you get this, you do this integra integral, whatever yes. it is. Yes, 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 yes. yes. This is related to the Ve peterson metric. It's like a discrete version. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then, okay, now, okay, now finally, we come back to this local homeomorphism. So, okay, so now, now we're going to prove it. So, okay, now suppose there exists a first order deformations of my circle pattern that preserve the conformal structure. So that means tau dot is equal to zero. So from our previous discussion, so that means there exists a harmonic function uh, use such that the period is in, in this form. So now this tau dot is equal to zero. So this, this, part, this part is gone. So just this guy, this guy, and then the conjugate harmonic function will be this part and this part. And then now you substitute it into this uh, Dirichlet's energy, then you have, oh, this expression. So this, the norm square of C dot times the imaginary part of tau. So this is the energy, Dirichlet's energy associated to these deformations. And then now the question is, is this energy really achievable by a discrete harmonic function? So can you really find such a harmonic function? And then it turns out it is not, you cannot find it. So the reason is the following. Okay, so if this C dot is non-zero, then you can, you can consider a smooth harmonic functions on the universal cover uh, of this C minus zero. So you just take this functions. So you have this log C, log of C, take C dot divided by C, and then minus I, take the real part. So it looks mysterious. The reason why we pick this is the following. We can pull back this function back to the torus, to the affine torus by the developing map. And then over the, over the affine torus, so if we consider this U uh, dagger, circle gamma, and the 
we look at what is the difference of these two, and then they are exactly differ by a constant, this imaginary part of C dot. So this is the reason why we, con we construct in this way. And then if you look at the, this, go to this gamma two, then you have this constant. And then, and then for this guy, you can also compute what is the delicious energy. And then it turns out metrically, and then you realize, and eh, suddenly, so this energy for this smooth harmonic function is equal to this one, and then which is equal to, to your discrete harmonic functions. Okay, but then it is impossible. So the reason is, so because this u star, uh, u dagger have the same period of u. And then, so this has the same period. So this, this constants are the same as this constant for this u. And then, but then we know that this u dagger is a smooth harmonic function. This should be the unique minimizer of the delicious energy. So it is the unique minimizer, unique minimizer. And then this guy is smooth, but then this guy, this u is piecewise linear. So, so definitely they, they are not equal. So that means, so this energy must be, so this energy must be larger than this one. So that means, so, so that means, Okay, so this energy must be larger than this one. So that means, so, so you cannot, okay. So that means this energy is not achievable by a discrete harmonic function. Okay, okay. So altogether, so that means this C dot must be zero. So if C dot is equal to zero, then so this C dot is equal to zero, C dot is equal to zero. So that means, so this function U is a harmonic function over a torus. It's a compact torus. So you can apply the maximum principle, then you can deduce that. So this U and then U star must be constant by maximum principle. And so the deformation that you get is trivial. Okay, yes. And then, okay, finally, so we have, uh, so this, the following statement. So this pi circle F from P theta to the space is a local morphism for non-Euclidean affine torus. And then, yeah, so this, everything we're looking at are, uh, a fine torus non Euclidean. So we have this C and tau. And then all together, so we have this thing is a covering map with at most one branch point, uh, the one most branch point. And then that branch point may be at Euclidean torus. So we don't know. We don't know whether it's a branch point. But then the claim is there's no such branch point. So I'm going to tell you so there's no branch point. Okay. So that's the, the final slide. So the so, okay, so there's no branch point at Euclidean torus. So the, the way how you prove it is, is by topology. So, okay. So what I want to say is, okay, so if you have this circle patterns on affine tori, so we know that all these circle patterns and also this affine structure are parameterized by the scaling part of the holonomy, A1, A2. So whenever you have this pi circle F, A1, A2, then you get, uh, you get tau, so the, the method, you get tau in the tangential space, and then you can also write this as c tau divided by tau, and then you have this uh this whole the, the real part of the holonomy is a one, the imaginary part is this guy, and then for for gamma one, so this a two, and then you have this kind. Okay, so you have you have these expressions, and then now what we only want to do is we want to show that this pi so called f is a degree one map. So so yeah, it only have one degree. So yeah, so yeah, you cannot give you Okay, so what we are going to do is, okay. Uh, so let me just make part of the picture. So this is my, my P theta. And then now I know that when, if I want to get the Euclidean torus, so this A1, A2 is, they're all equal to zero. And then now I have this projection, pi circle F. And then I, have, I get this tangential space, PM. And then, so this uh, Euclidean torus may give me some uh, conformal structure. Uh, this is tau zero. So what I'm going to do is I want to draw a circle here. I want to draw a circle. I want to draw a circle. And then I want to show that, so if I have a simple loop on P theta, when I project it, I will also get a simple loop. And then in this way, I will make sure this is a, a degree one covering map. So this is homomorphism. Okay, so what you need to do, okay. So you consider a loop, uh, you consider a loop here. So you just, you just make a loop, okay. And then one thing you should be careful is, so this parameter t go from zero to pi because on a fine structure, so this you have if you have tau c and then and then and then you as a CP1 structure, it will be the same as tau minus c. So 
so that means you don't need to go a, a full one. So you just get a half, then you will get the same CP1 structure. Okay. So if you want to get a simple loop, then you just go from zero to pi. And then, so this is a generator for this P theta. So really fundamental of this guy. And then now what you're going to do is, so you have this upper half plane here. So you want to you map it to the unit is, and then one observation is, so you know that this guy is bounded and then this guy is bounded. So if you look at this mapping, composition of this mapping, yeah, if you look at the composition of this mapping, then uh, you, 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 you can see something like this. And then if you make this out, goes to, goes to infinite, so make it so large, then these two terms will, will be gone. So what is left is, uh, is this term. So, so what can we see is the following. So if t go from zero to two pi, uh, zero to pi, then on p theta, I will get a simple loop. And then on the tetrameter space, if I go from zero to pi, I will also get a simple loop. I will also get a simple loop. So altogether, I know that this mapping is a degree, degree one map. And then so, so uh, in conclusion, so we know that it is a homomorphism. Okay, so this, this proof is due to Tan Chi Wu. So I learned it from him. Okay, so, so finally, there's some pictures, some elements of P theta. So yeah, so these are uh, uh, circle patterns on affine torus and then some more pictures. Okay, okay, As, I know that this talk is pretty heavy, but anyway, so I, anyway, good discretization means it's rich in multiple structures. Uh, thank you very much for your attentions. Thank you, Wei. Very nice talk. Um, and I'll open up the floor to questions. Do, do you have a paper on this? Yes, yes, yes. So here, 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 here. This one. Oh, so, there it is. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see it. Okay. Yeah. Nice but, talk. I got to go teach. Yeah. Yeah, the good thing about this talk, I think everything is on YouTube. So you can check it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, question. Yes, Tan. Yeah, so the um, the Tan uh, work they talked about the uh, double cover, and so that's where the projective versus the um, affine structure comes in, right? Yes, 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 yes. So if you stick to CP one structure, you don't have this two to one. Yeah, what I um, uh, thought was of interest in uh, the affine tori was sort of figuring out for a given combinatorics um, where that branch point uh, occurred. Because if you have a symmetric torus, um, sort of where you can interchange the two generators combinatorially, then there's sort of a natural point where you see yeah. um, the branching occur and the covering that. Yeah. Um, and so it was interesting, though, if it's not a, a symmetric thing to sort of figure out where that um, that branching a point uh, occurs. In other words, where the flip between zero and infinity um, um, sort of coalesces at a single uh, point. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's probably related to the Euclidean torus. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it's the Euclidean torus that you will get. Also, with regard to um, Phil's question about the um, the patch at uh, the um, the local chart at a vertex, um, so in general, you get a, a Riemann um, a conformal structure, whether or not um, things close up at that point. You you get sort of metrically uh, cone points, but yeah. uh, in terms of conformal structure. That's fine. So you could put a, a branch structure in. Yeah. And so, for example, um, you could put uh, some branch points and consider modeling um, the Weierstrass function on your torus. Yes. And I wonder if you've considered this. Um, yeah. The, what... the thing, yeah. So the, so the thing is, so if you have some uh, close Riemann surface and then you remove some points and then and then you, if you look at the CP1 structure, so that one. That space is huge. Infinite, the, the dimension is infinite, and then, and then, so yeah. So I think I don't know. So usually, I don't know. So I think there should be some work characterizing what kind of CV one structure that would really arise uh, from this circle patterns. I think yeah. Somehow I also I also don't know. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. Well, I wish Phil were still here. I don't know if he can hear us, but um, he's going to class apparently. But um, yeah, these uh, filling in these um, branch points. So you get infinitely many structures, I think, because you have sort of cusps yes, yes, that you yes. can put at those points. Yes. And um, but then if you um, put particular branch um, structures there, you cut down the number of these. Yeah, you, you can. Yeah. Yes. And so um, the question is whether you can start getting um, CP structures from the torus um, as sort of mapping to other domains with this branch structure. Uh, I'm not sure how to formulate this right, but I just think that the uh, branch structure, introducing a branch structure might be um, interesting here. Yeah, I, th I think so. It would be interesting that so instead of saying this is uh, the holonomy is identity, so you just prescribe the holonomy is something else. You just prescribe the holonomy. I want each vertex. So if you say a branch, so you just prescribe what is a holonomy, and then you look at what is this equation. So I think maybe it is a good starting point. Yeah, but I don't know. It seems quite difficult so because even with for this no branch point, I think it's already difficult enough. Elias has his hand up. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, let me say first uh, that I'm impressed by the beauty of your formulas. And this indicates that you have the right setting. Yeah, thank so, you. Um, this uh, thing about the conjugate harmonic functions, this is related to a problem which we were trying to solve um, uh, some 10 years ago, namely uh, to find a discrete analog uh, of the Hilbert transform. Mm. So the difference is that we were working with packings inside the disk, say maximal packing. And uh, we would like to find the conjugate function just from boundary information. Yes. Okay, so you can, for instance, you can take the radii, uh, then uh, it, say model the, the function u by uh, radii or by uh, differentials of the radii and then you get the function u star from the angles more or less hmm. and uh, uh, what we got uh, is something which approximates the hilbert transform hmm. but it did not really have these nice properties hmm. So, for instance, uh, this, this square is not the negative. Hmm. So, but we were just working uh, with the, uh, the packing alone and not with this pattern. So, you have yeah. this conjugate packing, and this may be the right approach also to consider things like the Hilbert transform. Yeah. The yeah maybe is that yes. we are not working on a affine torus, but uh, say in a disk and work with yeah. boundary values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say that. So if you have this circle packing, and then you look at the change of radii, so you can you can also see this is a harmonic function. And then I think I'm pretty sure this is not surprising to Ken because mm -hmm. I just read the that formula from from Ken's book. And then so you can also get this uh, harmonic functions graph Laplacian on circle packing. But then I think so one main difference between this that harmonic that graph Laplacian to the cotangent Laplacian is uh, is this property. So when you compute the division energy, so then you can express very nicely in the in terms mm. of the cotangent Laplacian. But then if you consider the graph Laplacian on circle packing, yeah, I I, I don't know. So I don't yeah, know this, whether you have this nice expression. Yeah, this formula on the bottom of this slide is also a wonderful thing. <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Thank this, you so this, much. This, yeah, this is the magic of cotangent Laplacian. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Yeah, but circle packing, maybe I think circle packing, there should be a, a formula like this, but I've never seen this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Any other yeah. questions? I, yes. Wait, yes. Could, I, could I just see the picture, some of those pictures at the end and wh where's the where's the torus? Oh, this is... No, next yeah. one. I mean, that one, of course. Yeah, 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 I know that. <laughs> oh, I see. So I see. So they're identified like, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, uh, yeah. Mobius transformations. Got it. 
Gotcha. Yes. Yeah, I hope you like it, Rich. I have talked to you about this for, for many hours. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you remember, I also always went to your office to talk about this. I remember. Yeah. 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 Good. That's I don't good. think you had the cotangent Laplacian. What? I don't, I don't, I don't think you had the cotangent Laplacian. I, I had, but I've never told you. Yeah. Yeah, I had, but yeah. But you didn't tell me. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't tell you. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's a surprisingly subtle, like it was sort of funny. I mean, the final okay. contradiction is really subtle. I thought you were just going to say, well, this has non-zero energy, so it's mm, no. you know, non-trivial. I mean, but, yeah, not quite. Yeah, that, was, that was kind of surprising. Yeah, th this this part, I, I stick to this part for a long time. So I when I went to your office, I always have this question in my how to prove this. Yeah. This result is more recent. I mean, how, how recent is this? Uh, almost, the, I think after I left Brown. So I think yeah. on the way on the way to Luxembourg. 